Welcome to the Startup Grind. So this is our second event here in Davidson, uh, and we're really pleased to uh, introduce John Baggiano, who is co-founder of Versamy and Everblue, uh, along with his brother Chris. Versamy is, uh, and its product Starling provide technology for parents to harness the learning potential of their child's uh, early years. Versamy leverages technology for large-scale impact to improve early childhood education and language development. So uh, John is leading Versamy's product development efforts. He scaled Everblue to 90 plus locations globally and was recognized as a White House champion of change. Uh, he also served in the Army and was a top performer at Carrier Corporation. He graduated from West Point and Stanford and is a proud father of three young children. So, please give a big Davidson welcome to John Baggiano. Thanks for kicking off our first start grind in, in our wonderful event space here. Thanks for having me. It's a really um, nice space. Yeah. So um, I like to start with uh, kind of how you got started on your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, you can go as far back as you want, but we usually start with college. Start with uh, college. <laughs> so you you went to uh, you went to West Point, and it seems like you've kind of been focused on uh, on uh, service for the greater good. For sure. your entire career. So tell us a little bit about uh, that. I'll, I'll go back to even high school. Okay. Uh, All right, good. Actually, right, middle school. Uh, my middle school and high school, uh, my middle school was very liberal, uh, startup school, predecessor to kind of today's charter schools, very much focused on service um, and you know, contributing to the greater good. And then uh, my high school was actually Jesuit, also focused on servicing other men for others, which is basically the model of the school. And then West Point was lifetime of service to the nation. Uh, and so when I left the military and I went to work for United Technologies, uh, it, uh, I, I did well there, but it wasn't, it was just a job for most people. Uh, and, and that wasn't, that, that, uh, that was frustrating for me on many fronts, like leaving work at five o'clock. Like, work doesn't end at five o'clock, like life should have, work, work should have a purpose. But work isn't just a place you have to exist between the other periods of your life. Um, and that's how I felt that most people were just existing there. Right. So for me, entrepreneurship is a service to country, service to humanity, we so we try to solve. We would start social businesses, we try to start solve really big problems, and then it's a way for me to have a purpose in life. And actually, I think that attitude has had a lot to do with your success. So that's a, a thread that we're going to see through the conversation. So you told me um, after, you, after you finished at West Point, which I'm assuming instilled some sense of discipline and getting things done and that, that type of thing, right? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. So af after you got out of West Point, you, you served in... Uh, told me Kosovo and Iraq. I was actually stationed in Germany for five years, and then from there I did, uh, I traveled with the military and privately all over Europe. Uh, right. Kosovo and Iraq, I did deployments too, a short time in Afghanistan. So right, so, quite so, the tour. so that had to have a huge impact, and you got in, into the military, or you were, your military service was after 9-11, and you told me that that kind of turned the military entirely on its head. It so actually was before 9-11. Oh, okay. uh, right. So the military I went into in 2000 was still in the drawdown mode from the post-Soviet, you know, post-Cold War era. Everything was extremely bureaucratic. You accounted for every yeah. round of ammo. There were rules to do anything. You literally couldn't like tie your shoelace without having to follow the manual on how to do it. It's a very bureaucratic army. Um, and then literally 9-11 happened and the military kind of turned on a dime. It was mission-oriented, get the job done, very decentralized. Not like not what most people think of the hierarchy of command, especially in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Kosovo. Like your you know, lowest level fire team and soldiers, they have a tremendous amount of influence. And you can't, they can't, there's no time to wait for the headquarters to tell them what to do. And so it, the army, the army itself became very what I call entrepreneurial and very innovative. In fact, I'd say that when we invaded Iraq, there's a saying that we were the most feared army in the world at that point in time. Um, you know, we invaded Iraq, we really like even from, nine, from uh, the 91 Gulf War until that point, we were the most feared army in the world. And then, but nowadays, people, people know we can blow up with IEDs. And like, the, the Iraqis thought we had shields because they, they couldn't hit our vehicles, but in reality, they were just bad shots. Uh, but, uh, uh, but so we were the most feared army, yet today, I think we're the most lethal. The, the army has continued to innovate. I mean, it was drones. We were getting drone updates.
updates every three months. We were getting new equipment and just a constant rapid fielding of new equipment and new techniques and new right. technologies. So we are way more lethal today than we were 15 years ago, yet the RI has kind of worn off a bit. So, so you were going through that with the service orientations. You saw this huge transformation of what used to be one of the most rigid hierarchies yes. ever invented, right? So, yep. And then you got a corporate job with United Technologies and right, went right back into a rigid hierarchy in corporate America, right? So Yes. Uh, I got, I'm exaggerating. No, but I, I got hired. I, I interviewed with a number of companies. I got hired. I was asked a ton of questions. Uh, and I, I, I continued to ask questions when I got hired. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And they were still using, and this was you know, 2005, six time frame, they were still using Unix mainframes in the 1970s. Um, and we couldn't even input, we had like a small army of people inputting invoices to build customers. And we couldn't build customers fast enough. Um, and so that's how I got into programming. I wrote a program so that I could actually build my customers so I could get the sales revenue and recognize it. And that became an operating system. For right. um, and you told me a story, I think. So what was your responsibilities with United Technologies? What was, what was your I was uh, you technically an inside sales and account manager. Yeah. Um, so I had a series of accounts, uh, Sprint Nextel, LA Fitness, um, you know, Target, and that type of stuff. So we would manage energy management systems and air conditioning uh, for those facilities. And you told me you, you know, you were very successful, producing really good results, plus writing this code to make, you know, to make yeah. things work better. Staying up till 2 a.m. in the morning, I, right? And then you show up the next day, five minutes late, and your boss is like. So, so there was a, we were joking about getting plunk desks because it was me and they brought in a whole bunch of, uh, at that point, Indian uh, visa workers for programming. So I was managing a small programming team and still managing the customers in the office and the sales piece. Um, and, and, so, and most of my customers were on the west coast in California. Um, we managed the western region for Sprint Nextel in particular. So my phone wouldn't even ring until 11 a.m. but I'd be taking calls till 9 p.m. Here I am doing all this extra work and then my boss is like, you need to be in at 8 a.m. Why? Like, am I not working enough for you? Like, what, what results am I not getting? <laughs> uh, and so it was, it was like this, this I, I, so at that point, I realized that as hard as I want to push, there was just no motivation or energy from the rest of the employees. A lot of them were lifelong career employees. It was just a very, very, very old line company is the way it was right. And that kind of motivated you to say, hey, I think I'm ready to be a little more entrepreneurial. But you got, you got an offer, right, from from a very large construction company from him. I, I did. My first boss at that company, so it was interesting, it was my brother who had gotten out of the military a little behind me, moved to Charlotte, and we, were, we lived across the street from each other. Him, I, and a third party had been talking about starting a business for almost two years. My wife called it the idea of the week phase, where literally every week it was a new business. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, there was never a convenient time to actually start a business. Yeah. Uh, it was always, well, I need this, I need a little more savings. Like it's, you know, in life, you only accumulate responsibilities once you graduate college. Right. Yeah, you can get a house, you get a dog, you right. all these things. It's just harder to right. uh, And so, I uh, so my my boss left, and he went to another company called Emcor, and uh, they had actually so in the spring of 2008, so February of 2008, they called me and they offered me a huge promotion. So I was just an inside salesperson, and then they offered me a general management position of a competing division for this company. So it was like a, a huge jump up. Corporate rock, a huge promotion, huge salary increase, lots of benefit increases. And uh, I wound up, they flew my family out to the downtown, I was like, with the Phoenix. But I turned it down, and I remember I was driving somewhere in South Charlotte, and I got this phone call. Uh, this was before spam phone calls, so I actually answered the phone a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I get this phone call, like, who do you think you are? And I'm like, excuse me? And he goes, this is Tony Guzzi, CEO of Emcor. I got to hear about the idiot that turned down this job. Uh, and I'm like, oh, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he went to my college, went to West Point as well. And he, uh, and so we start talking, and he's like, I cannot understand why you turned this opportunity down. I said, look, family's important to me. My brother just moved here. He's like, tell me about your brother. And so I say, oh, my brother's a West Point graduate as well. He, you know, kept background in mechanical engineering. Uh, that was his truck at West Point. And uh, so Tony said, like, okay, let me do something. So they off, they, they actually. They wanted me, so they offered, they flew my brother out for a different division in Phoenix. And the general manager of that division said, I've been told I have to hire you, so what will it take? So they really wanted They really wanted me, yes. And so my brother said, he called me and he's like, what do I do? And he's like, I got a plan. I'm going to make them such a ridiculous set of demands that they'll just have to say no. <laughs> so they actually said yes. <laughs> 
And so I remember it was a, literally a Thursday evening, and we were sitting down at the table and we're like, what are we doing? Like this is, I mean, these were significant salary increases. This, this was like, like the jump of you know, probably 10 years in the corporate world uh, for both of us. And, uh, and, we, and basically it was, if we do this, you, it's harder to go to zero the more money you make and the bigger, the higher you go up the ladder. It's harder to go to zero. And so we basically, that was the trigger that we said, if we turn this down, then we're like, Chris, my brother quit his job the next month. We're totally committed to yes. this. Yes. Right. Yeah, my wife, uh, my, we had a young son at that point. Uh, and so my, I, and my brother's wife had student loan debt, wasn't working, we both had mortgages. And so I, I waited a little bit to quit my job, but he literally quit his job. We burned the bridge, right. we turned down the job offers, he quit his job, and we started Everblue literally the next day. So Everblue was kind of a culmination of these experiences, a lot of these experiences for the military. And I mean, the, yes, your military experience taught you that the environmental resources of the world were not maybe being used quite. So appropriately, and then it, you know you still had the mission yeah. orientation. So we had um, coming out of Iraq, regardless of the political leanings, we care about the Middle East because they have oil, and that was our opinion that if we had if we if we had a, 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 if we depended less on Middle East resources, they would be better off um, as as countries and societies, and we would be better off as a country not importing their oil um, and not having to defend those oil interests. And so we, for the two years of research that we did, we were focused on energy and the environment. How do we reduce? What we looked at every technology. We looked. We spoke to we spoke to small businesses, big businesses. That was our our idea of the week. All resonated around right. Right. reducing energy dependence um, and increasing national security. And so when we started Everblue, we had all this accumulated history of research that we had done with the guiding passion. And the interesting thing is, we had spoken to so many people. We kind of had a rooting fan base, like of this network of people that we were able to reach out to. So we quickly, with Everblue, we had quickly secured contracts with the home builders. Um, to do energy audits under the Energy Star program, right. um, and so that was actually the first iteration of, uh, of Everblue. Well, how did how did that translate into a kind of a, a training? So, concept uh, I just want to highlight for any any startup entrepreneurs that I, I tell them that you know when you're out interviewing people, and meeting with people, those anybody you meet can become your advocate. And so you, you're starting your business the day you think about it, the day you talk to anybody else about it. Right. And so that network, when you're researching a topic, that becomes your network of support. Right. So people discount that. They don't understand. Like you should keep them updated. Send them an email. Put them on a free Mailchimp account and let them know where you are in your journey, so that they they can root for you. So we yeah. we we landed more contracts than we could service. A couple hundred thousand dollars worth of contracts, um, and we needed actually people to do the work now. So right. we did some of it ourselves, but um, we actually needed workers, and there was we couldn't find anybody that was trained that was trained or qualified to do it. And so that was we we actually we started doing training out of a need to train our own employees, and the phone kept ringing off the hook with other people saying. I need this training too. Literally, the deck of the page up. We closed a six thousand dollar order, um, and I was like, uh, "It's pay now, and we'll train you." in, at that point, it was like eight weeks out, um, and that we just bankrolled that money right into. And so, the business quickly got to the point by October of that year where we had a fast-growing training business and the energy audits on the houses. Um, we taught our first class the day we were broke. So it was this <laughs> interesting time to start a business as the, as the economic world is imploding. Here we are starting a business, quitting our jobs. Um, and uh, our third partner was very insistent that we had to focus, that we couldn't do both. And so we actually gave up the energy auditing business, as painful as that was, because it was a couple hundred thousand in revenue at that point. We gave that up uh, and we focused on training. But the training was, was really the training was like a near vertical. Right. Um, and one comment about the training, it was interesting. The, so we did some training, we got some feedback from like the Association of Builders and Contractors in Georgia. And we were like, so coming out of the military, like I, I'd done training for, taught at colleges, I did military training, and so we kind of had very high standards for ourselves, and so it was like, and we called the, we called the customer, and I'm like, what was the best thing about the training? Just, your instructor showed up on time. I'm like, no, no, really, like, what was the best thing about the training? She's like, no, you guys actually came and did the training, and like, that can't be, and so it was interesting how the construction industry bar for training was so low <laughs> that, like, it was, like it actually happened. Yes. The session happens. <laughs> that's that's check. <laughs> um, and we were motivational, and like we like it wasn't. And the other thing was that everybody everybody else that was in the environmental space was was categorized as long haired hippies from California. Right. And here we were, East Coast military guy people saying, you know, this is national security imperative. So when you go to Central Texas and you're talking about energy efficiency and renewable energy and that type of stuff, it's this is national security as well. Like it's it's, it's self-reliance. There's there's a different set of values that you can appeal to. Yeah. 
that weren't being met in the market. So the other, the other uh, really interesting thing that we talked about with Everblue was the whole financing picture, and you know how you how you financed the company, you sold the company, and then you ended up buying it back. So tell a little bit about we did so some of the, some of the key learnings of that whole experience. Everblue grew really fast, uh, and it quickly became our entire net wealth. Uh, and then we had started with a third partner who eventually wanted to exit the business. Um, and, so a com and so we had no operating agreement. We were just, we were starting the business and we were happy to have the money coming in. Like it was, cash was our focus, like we needed money to live and so let's go make money. Right. Um, at that time I was, and I still am, I still say I'm still a novice at the ways of entrepreneurship, but the idea of a startup and scaling, like what I know now, I didn't know any of that then. I just knew that I needed cash to pay bills. Um, and so how do I make money and quickly, you know, everybody, every other advisor in your life is saying, you've got this thing. And, and the phone kept ringing with companies that wanted to invest or buy us. Um, and so we had no exit plan. We, so now, if anybody starts a business, I would recommend having an operating agreement with your partners in advance of how are you going to handle these contingencies? If somebody wants to leave the business and they're not ready, how are you going to get them out? What's the rules before, before you get down that stage? Because once you're operating the business, you're so busy and it's, you don't want to risk emotional upset with a partner. So we wound up, we sold the business at the end of 2011. Um, big lesson learned is do your due diligence on who you sell to. So we were just so happy that we were selling the business. We actually, we, we almost sold it at the end of 2010. We walked away and then we came back to the same partner. Um, and a week after we sold them, they, they got in a world of proof from the federal government. Um, and they were essentially a fraudulent company that we had sold to. So it was, a, it was a huge nightmare at that point. And then five years later, we actually bought the company back. Uh, and they, they did nothing, almost nothing to it. It was like a collider. Um, like there was no engine, there was no thrust, it was just gliding slowly. Um, so it was a, a fraction of its former size, but it's still, I mean the website, things that I had written in t courses that we had taught um, online seven years, six, seven years earlier, were still us teaching them um, to tell you how little it changed. The copy on the website was almost identical. It was amazing how little changed. Yeah, so the key learnings there were have, have a buy-sell agreement so that you have a framework for a partner, partner operating operating agreement. Right. How are you? Our partner up and moved to California on us. The business was here. All, mm -hmm. Most of the employees, we were distributed and instructed around the country, but the headquarters of the business was here, and our partner just said, I'm moving to California, you can look out there, guys. Right. Uh, like, okay, well, how does that work? Yeah, exactly. So there was right. no, but we hadn't talked about that in advance. Like, what are the rules? What about vacation? Right. right. Uh -huh. You know, what about uh, spousal say in the business? What about family members wanting to work for the business? Right. Um, like, we had a, we, we basically had a no family member rule. Uh, but you know, people will come ask you for jobs once you start having a growing company, and like, what you, you, you got to talk about that stuff. Yeah, and due diligence on the buyer, not only because you know this is your baby that you created, you want to see it continue to succeed, but you know, a lot of times there's a payout over time, and you want to make sure that you're. I, from what I've been told, half half the half of merger and acquisitions wind up in a fight over the payout. Number one, and right. number two, we treated our employees like family, so this was an emotional event for them too. Right. Uh, right. And so it was very disruptive. Yeah. And then the money was good, but you were burned out at the end yes. of the experience, right? So that that kind of led to a different philosophy when you got started on Everblue. But before before we get into Everblue, you mean Versa? I'm sorry, sorry Versa. Um, uh, talk about a little bit about the family side of this and how you manage the balance between your personal and Business life, right? Because you burned it hard on Everblue. We did, and you wanted you wanted to just kind of set things differently for when you, when you got a diversity. So talk about that. So with Everblue, it was we started sprinting and we never stopped until we left the business. It was it really wasn't a long term plan. It was just we're going to grow this business as fast as we can. Um, and my wife, whose father owned his own business, you know, he worked six and a half days a week to his days in the seventies. He still, and she's like, I don't want that. That's not what I want. So she supported me to start this, but she was very clear in the long term that I don't want you, I, I don't want you working six and a half days a week. Um, right. And so when we started, we had burnt out in every book. When we started Bruce and me, I looked at it more of a marathon. Um, you know, it was a seven year, five to seven year commitment at least to the business. So I had a mental time frame and I was going to take vacations and I was going to commit to making sure I still go to the gym and making sure I still work out and doing the things that I needed to be healthy. And now I have three kids. And so making sure that they get my time and attention right. as well. Right. So, so the learning is to have that really, the longer term framework, have, have a, a structure and a plan and work the plan. Yep. Yeah. And, and set up all your KPIs around that. 
if anybody's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so you gotta, you gotta take right. care of yourself. You've gotta have your mental head in the game the entire time. Because we, our decision making near the end of Everblue probably wasn't the best because we were burnt out. We were, it was, you know, once you reach that state, it's really hard to recover from. So, uh, so when you, when you sold Everblue, you had the opportunity to do a fellowship at Stanford? We right? did, yep, yep, that was an adventure. We, so you have a question there? Or I no, I want you to tell the story. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, having done Everblue, and then having a number of our employees left and started other companies, and we kind of helped them seed them and kind of encourage them. And, and, and so we wanted to dive more into both entrepreneurship. Uh, I wanted to go to Stanford just for the experience of it. It's the center of Silicon Valley. It's kind of, you know, the East Coast entrepreneurship at the time was and was, still probably isn't as, as um, you know, as cool as it is out there. And so we, I, we went there. Chris and I both applied, um, and we, 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 it was the only place we applied to, and, we, and, we, and they, they like to have a diversity of candidates, and like, what if we only take one of you? Like, we're a package deal, it's both or none. Um, and that seemed to work, so they took both of us. Um, and so we both went to Stanford for this fellowship program. And we treated it like a, it, it, it was, unlike the younger, some of the younger folks, our program was a little bit older, but unlike a lot of the other MBAs and other graduate school, like we kind of, we had already done something, so for me it was, it was I, learned, I feel like I learned a lot more. I professionalized my experiences that I just learned by experience before. Because I felt like an amateur, a fraud doing, like, people kept calling me a successful business, but I'm like, where? And I'm like, you know, I, like, I felt like Everblue, when we were running Everblue, we were constantly a day away from failure. No matter how much money we made, no matter how much revenue grew, it was always, you know, the sales tomorrow aren't measuring up, why are the phones not ringing? It was always like this. Always on the fear of falling off the cliff edge. Yeah. Um, and then I came, then I went to Stanford and I realized that that is like that for every business. You know, the CEO of Google feels that way, and they're you know one of the most successful companies in the world. And so it's and so that's just that's just business. And so I went I, I kind of I realized that and that, that that idea of feeling like an amateur in business is something that everybody experiences in a startup. Yeah. yeah. So while you were there, Chris read an article. So I talked about mission and yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah. Well, Everblue was both an education business and focused on energy and the environment. And we, right. we purposely made the decision. We sat down and we said, what do we, what do we want to focus on? Do we want to stay in the energy and environment realm or do we want to go after education? Because with Everblue, we started training, um, we, we started training community colleges, um, prisoners, laid off steel workers, and we were, we, were, we were getting money to retrain workers for new skill sets. So middle-aged workers for new skill right. sets. And it was extraordinarily difficult. Um, in, you know, you, it's people that lack basic math skills. Like a lot of people, renewable energy and smart grid, all these topics are fairly technical. Right? And even though, yes, they're blue collar jobs, they still require knowledge and skills. And, and you gotta have a kind of a certain academic or an educational background to be able to do it. It was very frustrating for us. And so we decided to go after the education route. Plus, having children ourselves, we kind of wanted to know, okay, what can we do? Like we could not find tools to grow in the business. So that we decided to focus on education. So now the article. What was the article? So okay. So we, we spent two years researching innovation in education. That was kind of we were going to find something to be innovative at scale in education. People were like you should go start a charter school. I'm like that's great. I can help a couple hundred kids. I'm looking for something that can like Khan Academy is one of the best examples I can point to. Right. Uh, right. You know something that can have an impact at scale. And we turned over every rock to include Khan Academy, but every rock of things you've heard of and things you haven't heard of, and we walked away wholly disappointed. And in the state of ed tech, there's a lot of the smart board effect. They sound good, but they're practical. They don't have any impact, and that gets nothing's moved the needle. I also took a very depressing class at Stanford about the state of education reform. Fifty years and trillions of dollars. If you're an African American child, your test scores really haven't moved anywhere. Like we have not. I mean, nothing we seem to do in K through 12 education, no amount of reform seems to actually move. Right. And that's been 50 or 60 years. And it's not like, oh, the one reform failed this year. And everybody keeps going out with rose eye glasses, like, this is going to work, this is going to work, this is going to work. So we got to the end of that, and we were literally ready to walk away. We were like, there is nothing we can do in education. We were literally like, we're going to go solve a different problem. Let's go somewhere else. Um, and then Chris read an article. And Stanford is a big, messy place. It's like a ball of yarn. So even though we spoke to everybody we thought about in education there, it was all, we had this mental framework that education was like K through 12 and up. So Chris read an article on the front page of the New York Times about um, Anne Fanal and the Infant Learning Lab, um, it's a neuroscience and language learning lab at Stanford, and uh, and she was and there's all this research about the first three to five years of life and what you do in those years essentially clocks your raw brain speed. Like the neurons, your brain speed 
in your brain is largely set before you enter kindergarten. So if you want to revolutionize education, you have to start at birth. And you have to do it before kindergarten. And the remarkable thing is it never even occurred to us because we were trapped in this mentality that education starts right. in kindergarten. Right. And everybody around us had this mentality that education is, you know, classroom and teachers and schools and like, and, and once you break out of that, it's like, wow, this is so powerful and nobody was looking at it. And so we went to her lab, we just went, we said, hey, can we come visit? She had 13 people in her lab and she was so excited that somebody with a technology bent. She kept us like four hours, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, and so that was, that was how versus it was born. And that's interesting that you had to read the article to find out that she was at there Stanford. And, yeah. and get the in, insight and the inspiration. So that's. That's really cool. And that, uh, when I was researching for, for the event tonight, on some of your background, I came across the Radius of Play yep. so, uh, video that's out on YouTube. So talk a little bit about that. And, you know, we don't have time to do the whole thing. No, right? but so, sure. It's uh, one of the themes that we came across in, in innovation education is that uh, both technology and as we've poured more money and with no child and left behind, like we, we, we get really good at the things we can measure. So you get to measure math scores. But then things like play and creativity, and, and there's this idea that there's also this urgency around how do we teach. We'd also looked at, my business partner's a woman, and we were looking at how do we get, and we have four daughters between my brother and I, how do we, how do we get girls to be, have more STEM confidence? And we had done some projects even in first grade where literally we ran camps, after school camps, for um, first graders. And if we called it engineering camp, it would be all boys. Right. If we focused the same curriculum, but you focused on more of the art and creativity, it would be a 50-50 mix. And so it was really interesting how, as early as six years old, kids are self-selecting how. Right. Um, and so the radius of play, and a lot of this comes down to how kids play, and the freedom that we give kids. You know, everybody thinks more flashcards, more, more strict learning structures. Even Legos now are less free play, and they come with super strict instructions. And then, you know, now with, now with the, the, the advent of cable news, parents are so terrified that kids don't go out, they don't, they don't have free range, they don't explore. The, the idea that a parent lets one, like their child walk from one house to the neighbor's house to go knock on the door. And the fact that there were fewer kids, we've gone from four kids to three kids to, you know, one point something, and then in the Bay Area, there's one kid per child. Like, there's just fewer kids to play with. And so, a child's experience to explore their world has shrunk significantly. And that experience, particularly more so for girls, parents are less, trusting of letting their girls go explore. But that is critical to developing STEM confidence and the, and the, the skill sets that come behind it. So that's, the radius of play is that our society mm -hmm. in the last 80 years, that the, the radius of, of what we let our kids do and experience has shrunk significantly. And so that's what do we do about it both from a technology standpoint and as a parent? So as a parent, we, I like to think in boundaries and concentric circles and just thinking about, okay, I have, a, you know, I have an 11 year old now. What do I allow him to do? You know, my old office used to be three quarters of a mile from the house. I used to let him bike to the office. Right. You know, my parents were like, you're crazy, you can't let him do that. I'm like, mom, I used, to, I used to do that when I was a kid. Like, the, like this, this, this is much safer than where I grew up in, you know, outside of New York City, Jersey City. And so, <laughs> um, and so with being very conscious about the boundaries, and yeah. then, you know, there's this movement now in like Utah where they passed a law that parents, um, Parents, they allow parents the judgment. So it's not neglect if you let your child walk home from school. You get to choose what age your child is appropriate. And there are now parents, there's this movement of parents that drop their kids off, you know, in a city and say, go find your way home, like at 10 and 11 years old. And they have to, they have to figure, like, like that, so there's this, so as a parent, I would say, be very intentional. Do you give them a cell phone, you know, just in no case. cell phone. No cell phone? <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but, but there were parents that were getting in trouble for doing that. Yeah. And, and there's this movement of, uh, called free range parenting. And so anyway, that's the, the radius of play is all this idea of we have shrunk the experiences that we give our kids into being very manufactured, like microwave dinners. Everything is a scheduled experience now rather than allowing them to be. So just real quickly, how does Versa May kind of uh, address those things? How, how, does it, how does it try to tackle that? So there's, Versa May has there's a software and a hardware component. Mostly what we, we are a parental education system, so parents are education or a tool of change. Um, like they're the agent of change, and so first is all about influencing parental behavior. So we give the parents play prompts. We give the parent, and those the parents love those. It's it's changing the mindset when you get home from work. You know, giving you a prompt to sit down and, and be creative with your child, um, and those and those are highly developmental. Um, and then we have a wearable device that allows you to track it. It's not it's not about the actual data. It's about the awareness and the mindfulness of being present. And so that's that's how it ties in. So we, we also talked about fundraising for Versamy and 
Uh, you said the how and why was more important than the idea. So, so explain yeah. what you meant by that and, and what what your what your concept is now about how to approach fundraising. So after we sold everything, we've done angel investing, and then with Versity and, and the companies that I've seen that are successful, including our own, is you, you're trying to solve a problem, right? And you're going down a path, and the military call it a movement to contact. You don't know you don't know what you're going to face, but you're going to go you're going to go develop the situation when you get there. Uh, and that direction that you're going in, and who you and who you are, and who the team that you've collected. Like for us, being mission oriented companies, we have employees that volunteered for us for three months before. Like like we can't hire you. One employee volunteered at the graduating Stanford until we could hire her. Like that happened multiple times where people were so passionate about the problem that they wanted to work for us, and so it helps attract talent, but it also attracts investors. If you say, well, "We like, here's the idea of how we're going to solve that problem," but it's going to iterate. This is what we're doing, and here's the proof of that need of this problem. That's okay. Whereas the, you know, I, I meet mean, with a lot of people that say, "Oh, I've got, I've got the perfect idea, but I don't want to share it because someone's going to steal it." <laughs> like unless it's some super technical patent thing. Usually yeah. it's not the idea, it's the direction you're that going That doesn't in. sit well with investors. Yep. And then <laughs> the, if you choose a really interesting problem to solve, investors, there are investors that have passions. Right. And, when, and if you become passionate about that problem, word gets out. And, they'll and so you. we had Stanford classmates that begged company, like went to the VC circuit in Silicon Valley, begged to raise money. And then here we are, and like we met with one Chinese billionaire, and it was literally a 30 second conversation. His wife, my wife fired the nanny this morning for not talking enough to our child. And wrote us a five hundred thousand dollar check uh, in like thirty seconds. Another one, Nikki goes so to lunch. He found you. He found us because he's like, "This is a problem in my life." And then another one, Nikki went to lunch and uh, coffee to meet coffee with an investor. And he's like, "I'm going to write your nanny." She's like, "I can't take that much. It's not enough in our round." And he's like, "You're one of the most innovative companies in ed tech. I need to give you some money." So she walked away with two hundred fifty thousand. But it's if you solve an interesting problem and you're passionate about it. It makes it a lot easier to manage the like. It, it's a little bit different in Silicon Valley too, right? Uh, but the money will find you if you can tell if you can tell why you're going to solve that interesting problem, right? It's not the idea. That's what I would say, right? I, I think I think there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, the, the harder a fundraising campaign is for a startup, you know, it's like, well, you should internalize that and think about, you know, why is that? Why yeah. is it so hard? Why aren't they coming to you based on the you know, the idea that you're tackling and the, and the passion you have around it. Yeah, and, and the more you need the money, the harder it's going to be a raise. And so if you don't need it, like we were willing to self-fund, and so we basically said, look, we, we will self-fund this to start. We don't need your money. That kind of, it, it almost made it, it made it a lot more attractive. Right. Um, and so, so just just one more question, then um, we can open it up to you guys. I, I know you've, you've got some burning questions right here that, <laughs> that you've been saving for tonight. So. Uh, so you're an investor yourself, right? And yes. you've looked at a lot of companies. Yep. Is there anything else you want to, for, for a startup who is in the fundraising process, do you have some nuggets of wisdom on you know, what you personally look for, or how you do your screening process? So what I'd say is that um, fundraising is a process that doesn't just begin when you say we're raising our round now. It's the right. Pre-scheming is the it's when you go and ask for advice and you say, hey, we're thinking of raising around. How much do you think we should raise? What like that advice generating stage is when you raise your round. It's not like it's it's this it's this dynamic of people think there's I'm just going to magically start raising my round on August 1st. I'm going to close it by August 30th. It's relationship right. building, right? Um, and then the other thing that we did between our seed and our on our Series A, the thing that drives me nuts as an investor. Somebody comes to me and says, I need money. Great, I write them a check. I literally don't hear from them again until a year later and they're like, I need more money. Okay, well, what have you been doing? Uh, and why haven't you told me? What you so did? one of the things we did when we, when we raised money the first time was every week our investors got an update, literally every week. And then every one of them said, okay, I got it. You can slow down now. And then we went to once a month. And then we went to once a quarter. But when we came to raise our Series A, they knew that like, we were over communicative and we were communicative of our, we had you know, our opportunities and our challenges and general updates, like we had a very good format. And we were honest about our challenges so there were no surprises. Yeah. Um, and you know, technology takes longer to develop than expected, like it's more expensive. Like, there's all these challenges, but we were radically transparent and upfront and uh, forthcoming, and that made it super easy to raise the next round because there was no question that from their perspective, we were going to do right by them and we were communicating. So there was, no, there was no blind spot, it wasn't like, where are you in the last 10 years? In a way, that obligation to communicate with your investors helps you kind of 
look at your framework that you started with, that seven-year plan, and assess how, how am I moving, not only against my KPIs for this week or this month, but where am I on that on that entire framework that I started with? Yep, and we have, right. some, we have some internal goals that we wanted to hit, and so if you're raising money, it starts the day you even think about it, and it starts with everybody you talk to, and they become kind of your support network. So there was one other thing that we talked about, which I thought was really important, which is having your documents uh, prepared. That drives you crazy, right? So, but now it does. Yeah. Um, my, my business partner, Nikki, came from the private equity world. And so she, we built our data room as a company from the day we started the company. We had a box folder that was separate from everything else with literally every document in it that we would need. She kept that thing organized. And so when we would meet with family office and they said okay we'll invest in you so I've seen this happen a lot where you'll say I'll invest in you and then something happens between that promise of an investment and getting the actual check and you don't get the money right so if you want to close it quickly and you want to maintain a good impression as soon as they ask for something by being organized and having your ducks in a row before you even go out there literally you know this guy said I need these items and right. Nicky opened a laptop and sent it to him and he was so blown away at how organized we were that he didn't even do the, like the due diligence was simple because he's like, if you're that organized, I'm gonna trust you. Like it, it's, and then we got the money because that 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 gap between promise and payment is is, is, a, is a big failing point for a lot of companies. So like taking two weeks to scramble and try to get your documents together just to respond to an investor is not a good thing. Do that all for you. That was part of the reason why we didn't sell in 2010 at Everblue was because we didn't keep any doc. Like it was a mess. We had you know between contractors and employees almost 100 people and it was. We need their resumes. You want to see them? Like, you want to see who these people are? Like, where, where are their hiring contracts? Like, we didn't have all that stuff right. all over. Right. Okay. That's all right. Awesome. So, uh, I'm going to turn it up. You do have a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, so Dallas, I'm sorry. We can talk a little bit about uh, about partnerships. About you know, obviously, you know, you and Chris have gone in a couple of these. You've also had some other partners that you know, outside of the two of you. Uh, what has worked for you? What has not worked for you? When? When uh, creating those partnerships, what advice would you give? Um, so this is this is interesting and, and, and timely because we just uh, we were talking about starting and like seeding another business with another founder recently, and we just pulled the plug on it. Um, and it's in contrast to another another uh, partnership that we just formed. What we look for is emotional maturity, so the ability to actually have that honest conversation. Back to that operating agreement. So many people are afraid to talk about. You know, to, like what happens if you get hit by a bus? Does your wife get your shares? Like, like if you can't talk about these things when you're starting the business, you're not going to be able to talk about them during the business. If you can't talk about them now, when you have an employee that I like and you don't, and I want to fire them and you don't, like you wind up all these things. You've got to you got to be able to have those honest communication beforehand, and you got to put the partnership first. It's like entering into a marriage. And so if you can keep the partnership top of line and understand that the partner, the partnership arrangement, from what I've seen. Partner burnout and partner fights torpedo more companies than just about anything else. Yeah. Um, and so, like that, that, that honesty up front. In this one case where we pulled out, every time we had a conversation or gave him feedback, he got super defensive. And it's and so that, that made us hesitant to have an honest conversation. And that and that and so it wasn't a natural. So we were like, you know what? It's pro it was a super promising opportunity, but I just know that we are not going to work together as good partners. And so, in the partnership side of things, it's the partner above the partner above everything else, even above the amount of money you make. Like we're going to change one of our partnerships with Nikki. Uh, we're going to change the partnership structure. And the first thing we both acknowledged was our friendship and our partnership is more important than the actual terms that we're going to talk about here. And so that, like, just being clear on acknowledging that. Yeah. How have you, Chris, managed to maintain your personal relationship while also maintaining your business relationships with yours? Um, the personal relationship has gone, you know, it's like a, it's gone up and down over the years, but the business relationship has been really steady. Um, we put a firewall between the business and the personal side, hence like the no family member working for the business role. We're going to change that for our children, but um, the we've we've managed to one take different focuses in the business, and then two, while we may disagree on things, we tend to we basically we work on unanimity, like we have to agree on stuff. We're both action oriented, but if we disagree, we kind of talk it out, um, and so it's it's worked out it's worked out well. But we both, to me, that business relationship was more important than any individual moment of business decision. Or business, yeah, business. Has uh, I'm going to piggyback on that. Has that ever come up with investors who were concerned oh, about in, uh, investing in you know brothers? Yeah, that were people, people usually say, well, at least you're not husband and wife. 
a lot of investors won't invest in right. husband and wife. Right. Right. Uh, the, yeah, but Chris and I are very different people, and the fact that we've done it successfully before, I think, puts a lot of people at, at ease. Um, right. So I think right. that that is. But the, I'd say the hardest part of starting a business is not the idea, it's finding a good partner. I know so many people that want to start a business, but they don't have anybody to do it with. And it's a lonely road if you do it yourself. Yeah, doing it by yourself is, takes a whole lot more time. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've got a cousin who's been running his own business for the last seven years, and he's like, I do everything. I'm the HR, I'm this, I can't, he can't even take vacation. So he's about to start a new business with a partner, and we were just coaching through this, and he's like, I'm looking forward to having somebody else I can turn off, and he can have it. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a, the partner's probably the hardest part of starting a business. So solo founder companies do succeed, and some succeed quite well, but um, starting a company is a whole lot of work. There's yeah. a million tasks before you actually built a business in an organization. My, my perspective is solo, solo founder companies have really key employees that are almost like right. founders. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody in the audience here said today, I'm a right-hand woman. Like, like somebody's got to play that backup role. Right. Right. For any growth business, you, know, you can start a bakery and two employees, like what I'm talking about for a growth business. Okay. Question. Does it matter where you're located to be an entrepreneur and why do you choose to live here? Um, so I've lived in Silicon Valley and I've lived here. I chose to live here um, for family and quality of life reasons. So this is the other thing of the, the why. It's not just the problem solving, but why are you an entrepreneur? And so for me, being both in the military, which is, you know, even though I had a lot of local control in my jobs in the military, the military always told me, this is going to be your job. This is where you're going next. This is your role. Like, I didn't have any, I, I, I missed lots of family reunions. I missed lots of family events. I had no control in my personal life. Uh, and then United Technologies, I had very limited vacation. My boss wanted to be in at 8 a.m. Like, and so for me, being an entrepreneur uh, was to have the freedom and the flexibility to be able to spend time with the family, to be able to work as I see fit. Like the, that, that personal freedom was, was, is as important, if not more, than actually making money. I need to make enough money, but to me, having that personal freedom. So for me, that's the, the why of the business. Um, and then that's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the key of it. Any, any others? Yeah. Um, so one challenge we're facing right now is we're growing as a company. It's kind of we're getting to that point where we have enough employees that we need to start putting more structure around things. Um, so right now we don't really track time off, and you know we don't have formal job descriptions for some folks. So we're starting to to hit that point where we need more structure, um, especially from an HR perspective. And I know that's kind of the unsexy part of any business is the HR side of things. Do you have with scaling these companies? Do you have any kind of lessons learned or regrets on the HR front, or things you wish you had implemented earlier? Um, Regarding so, you know time off or benefits or hiring or you know HR is very all encompassing but I uh, we so we have it, it's interesting it's like a plane hitting turbulence when you hit <laughs> you know it, it's for me it's when I can no longer talk to employees like if I can't talk to every employee every day mm -hmm. that's when I start getting the structure yeah. um, usually so my brother and I have very different roles like I'm usually the employee caretaker I'm kind of their counselor like I, I and so like you know when I hit somewhere around 20 employees all of a sudden like. Now somebody's working for somebody else and they don't feel loved and like it's managing that as a rough transition. My biggest lesson learned is that uh, um, I need to pay. I, we need to we pay more money now for good management, um, and that's and that's basically like it's you need to bring in really top quality people at that early stage because a lot of it is like it's I, we've tried the bureaucracy thing of trying to put in more rules and that doesn't really work well. I also learned that. There's natural turnover. Like we turned over almost our entire varsity team from the very early stage. Like us, literally working in a garage in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. you know, as six or seven people to going to 25 <coughs> people. Like you, there's there's just di people have different stages of different companies. So I'm not afraid of turnover anymore. I kind of view it as you're going to leave my company when you retire, die, or find a new job. So let's just be friends about it. And when you've outgrown the life cycle of the company, we can part ways amicably. But at that stage now, my current belief is find really good managers. Like find top quality managers. Um, even if they're expensive, and just like, like that's, that, rather than trying to go the bureaucratic route, um, because I, I don't seem to be able to write a set of rules um, around expenses that work. Like, I just, it, it amazes me. We just had another example of, uh, of an executive that left one of our companies, and it's like, there doesn't seem to be any amount of rules I can put in place to enforce the discipline. But if I hire good people with good values mm -hmm. that are committed to the company and the mission, they, that, that, they will carry that passion. So passion is what I tend to hire for in that first line managers and that 25 to 100 employee stage. But it's tough. Yeah. So when you say hire good managers, are you sourcing them from MBA programs or? I look, so when I say good managers, they gotta have the skill set for management, but they gotta have a passion for the problem. Yeah. And then I say experience doing it. 
Um, so we hired a product manager from Shutterfly. So it, it's more about why do they want to come work for your company, but you know, I, it's, I've seen this in a local company, Tech Talent South brought in you know, a woman from Wall Street, and she's phenomenal at their operations. But like, so it's kind of like the adult leadership in the room. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, so for me, that, that may not be the right answer, but that's, I, we've experienced that twice now. And, it's, and we're thinking about it with a third company as well, so it's interesting. Okay. Any other questions? Not, that's a, oh, uh, got one more. So I guess uh, with a company in its infancy, how do you kind of navigate the potential legal risks, you know, patent trolls and just getting sued by folks that could just, you know, put you in court until you run out of money? Um, so we definitely have patent trolls. The, uh, and so, one, there is, at least when we started versus me, there was stealth. So we kind of stayed under the radar until we were ready to, until we were ready to publicly unveil. And then, um, the other thing with the, um, with the with the patent trolls and the legal risk is the it's, it's a strategy. So we, we, we have a portfolio of patents. It's a single patent won't do. Um, so you have to have a defensive strategy and you have to have an aggressive strategy. Unfortunately, it's expensive legally, and so it's just built into our budget. I mean, just one letter, I mean, one back and forth series of letters was like $30,000 uh, around one. Another person that claimed we were infringing on their patent, even though our technology was completely different. Uh, but they didn't know that because we didn't. Nobody knows how the technology works. We it's like a trade secret, and so it's it's it's, it's expensive. But yeah, you just you have to expect it, and that's a part of. You can get depressed about it, but that's just a part of life. And so we, we the other thing is the network. So one thing I'll say about startup Brian Stanford is very good about asking other people for help. So we've gotten really uh, kind of in a literally in a garage actually uh, in Palo Alto uh, by a couple of startup companies that realized that they needed to build their uh, resource networks, not only to reach more customers, but just to kind of share best practices and information about what it's like to go through a startup experience. So they came across the idea of put, uh, basically putting on monthly events, um, and in the first year their events grew from, you know, actually something like this, uh, to, uh, to pretty large audiences, and they began to scale out uh, kind of uh, establish their methodology and their platform begin to scale out nationally. And uh, today it's global in scope. There's 400 cities that do these fireside chats with uh, successful entrepreneurs on a monthly basis. Um, and uh, uh, there are two annual conferences, one in London and one in Redwood City. In, in February, the, the conferences draw pretty large crowds. I went to the one uh, in California last year. There were around 7,000 attendees, uh, 100 startups exhibiting, and uh, we set up quite a lot of um, uh, investor appointments and you know meetings with VC firms. And they had kind of a who's who of the industry presenting, so it was it was awesome. Um, so. The whole, the whole idea of this network is, is uh, it's values-based. Uh, in fact, some of the values that are on the wall over there are derived from startup grind. You know, make friends, not contacts, uh, give before t uh, taking, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, uh, it's values-based, it's forward-leaning, and the idea is to build a uh, fairly substantial global membership network through the events. So today on the Startup Grind platform, there's over a million entrepreneurs. Um, they run a, a base camp site, which is now a Slack channel for the directors and for all the entrepreneurs. That So to become a member, all you have to do is attend an event. You know, and then if, if you want, you can kind of opt into the information channel. It's incredibly useful for us uh, for uh, uh, activities like our uh, accelerator program, we're able to uh, publish that out through the Startup Grind Network and reach directors on the ground pretty much in all the southeastern cities, which is our, our target market. So, uh, and it's also a, a network where you, if you have a specific need, like for a technical resource or a, a you know a person that you're looking to hire. You know, you can put it out on this, this network, it goes out globally, and um, you get pretty good responses. So it's a, it's a tool that, uh, you know, by uh, 
Julie is a co-director here in Davidson with me, so it's a tool that you guys could use if you're looking for, hey, does anybody know anybody that does whatever, right? Uh, so we, uh, we put on the monthly events, uh, and uh, we have an opportunity for some of our inception stage startups to go to the annual, annual conferences. Uh, that's an application-based process, and uh, that gives them exposure to a pretty large universe of investors and a large universe of startups to interact with. Um, so thanks for being our uh, inaugural speaker in, the, <laughs> speaker in the event space, right? Thanks for having me. So, um, so this is, uh, we are going to videotape this, and uh, the, the videotape will be professionally edited um, so I'm going to ask, ask you guys for uh, one favor tonight. So I'm going to introduce you off camera. Okay. Okay. And when I introduce him, I need you guys to like clap and hoot and holler and sound like a crowd of at least 100 people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Something in the world wants to charge you 10,000. You don't like quality is necessarily by price. So finding really good resources is from asking for help in the network. Because there's always companies that step ahead of you in the stages. Okay, that's a wrap. So. Give John a big hand. <laughs>